Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, my very favourite lesson, uh, one of my favourites is 76. I, I like 100, 107 as well, but this one is one of my favourites because I really like... <clears throat> also, another one of my favourite lessons is lesson 14, but I think this ties in from lesson 14. Okay, so lesson 14. Uh, so I'm going to just... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Did you say 14? No, no, I didn't. Ah, it, 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 it's, it's 76, okay. but yeah, it, it reminds me of 14. Okay, okay, reminds okay, me of 14. Sure. Okay, so lesson 76. <clears throat> so I'm going to read a bit and then just, just chat a bit about it. Um, so I'm under no laws but God's. Okay. We have observed before how many senseless things have seemed to you to be salvation. Each has imprisoned you with laws as senseless as itself. You are not bound by them. Yet to understand that this is so, you must first realise salvation lies not there. While you would seek for it in things that have no meaning, you bind yourself to laws that make no sense. Thus do you seek to prove salvation is where it is not. A little comment on that. Uh, you seek for things <coughs> which have no meaning, because everything in the world, the world of the transitory, has no meaning. Um, so it's, it's when you give anything in the world the transitory, like thoughts, objects, bodies, uh, money, all of those things, medicines, all of those things meaning, then the, the ego can be identified with them. And then when the ego is identified with those things, they become the attachments or the things under which you experience. So remember from lesson 14, the things that the ego identifies with, which are personal, are your own personal hell, and there are collective belief systems within the ego which are our collective hell within the illusion. So as we let release those and make them all meaningless, uh, we uh, release ourselves from the limiting ideas which uh, underpin uh, this illusory world. So paragraph two. Today we'll be glad you cannot prove it, for if you could, you would forever seek salvation where it is not and never find it. The idea for today tells you once again how simple is salvation. Look for it where, it where it waits for you, and there it will be found. Look nowhere else, for it is, no, for it is nowhere else. That paragraph reminds me very much of uh, St. Francis's famous quote, one of my favourite St. Francis quotes. What you're looking for is where you're looking from. So it's one of uh, St. Francis' famous quotes. What you're looking for is where you're looking from. So when I'm in my ego, looking outside, looking for something for salvation, I won't find it. So if I look for salvation in a donut, if I look for salvation in money, if I look for salvation in uh, a partner, then that's not where salvation lies. It's, that's looking into the world from the ego, looking. But what you're looking for is where you're looking from. So before you can look outside, there's a place prior to where you look, which I'd call the witnesser. E that which witnesses even uh, images, one's imaging of the world, for example. So if one is looking now, one is uh, aware of images. So one is looking out, you could say one is almost looking out into the world with images. But what is prior to the images? What is prior to the thoughts? What is before thoughts and before images? and before the senses. So there is something in which all of this happens, which is before. The witnesser of thoughts and images is prior to that. And then we start to unhook from the identifications, from the pre-existing meaningful uh, objects which the ego is identified with, or thoughts. So I really think, you know, when St. Francis was sort of saying, what you're looking for is where you're looking from, it's almost like he was saying the observer because the observer looks at all things and it looks at, at everything. So there is the, the universal observer in which the world of the transitory is just passing and yet that it can never pass. The witnesser which sees even galaxies start and pass away, the witnesser which sees the body arise and pass, all images come and go before it and all thoughts come before it. So, uh, number three, paragraph three. Think of freedom in the recognition that you are not bound by all the strange and twisted laws you have set up to save you. You really think that you would starve unless you have stacks of green paper strips and piles of metal discs. 
<laughs> you really think a small round pellet or some, <clears throat> some fluid pushed into your veins through a sharpened needle will ward off disease and death. You really think you are alone unless another body is with you. I, I, really, I really love this paragraph mm -hmm. because it, it really puts under the chopping block some of the ego's most cherished mm -hmm. ideas on, 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 on this yeah. planet. So here we've got, um, you really think you're bound by all the laws uh, within this um, world of fear and separation. Um, so you really think you would starve unless you have stacks of green, well that's money of course, stacks of green paper. So it's like, you know, it reminds of the Lord's Prayer, give us each day our daily bread. You know, actually what is the provider of sustenance for the body? It's your spiritual connection to God. And when you have a strong spiritual connection, food may come to you through money or, or, or it may come to you through the miraculous. And if you look at all the spiritual teachers, they usually have the high spiritual teachers. A lot of them, um, especially when they get high, they're not usually doing a nine to five job because they're not really, their egos are not really <laughs> capable of doing a nine to five job in the local office. But, uh, but they, they do, I mean, I remember like Hawkins would just walk out of his little wooden shack in the middle of Sedona and somebody would offer him some biscuits, you see. So it's like but with hardly any food and yet any time there is a requirement for food, food arises from somewhere. Uh, and I love the story with Muji. You know, he was made, as I remember it, he told the employment office that he wasn't looking for work, so they cut off his benefits. And uh, <laughs> anyway, he was, he was, he was homeless. Uh, uh, and, then, and then as soon as he was homeless, this man just looked at him and said, I think you need a banana, and gave, <laughs> gave him a banana. And that was like the thing of like, you surrender, you surrender your fear-based ideas of what it is in the world that looks after you, and you go into grace, and you realize that the universe when you're in those vibrations, will will um, uh, if it if it's uh, if the, if it's God's will, will provide bananas and biscuits whenever the when it, whenever required, if that's the, if that's the universal will. So um, and you really think okay, so you really think small round pellet of fluid pushed into your veins through a sharp needle will ward off disease and death. So this is talking about medicine and doctors. Uh, which the Course would call magical beliefs, you know, that if you take this tablet it will cure your migraine, or if you take this, uh, so that's a magical belief, or the idea of causality, that any object out there has, the has any intrinsic power within it, you know, like a, like a little tablet actually doesn't have anything in it, doesn't have any intrinsic power uh, within it, but the belief in it has the power. So if you believe it, or you believe the doctor that gives it to you, then that has power. So this is not true. It's not to say that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not against using magical things, but just talking about the lesson from this perspective. You know, um, um, like I cancelled my belief in asthma uh, while I was taking inhalers, uh, but also didn't feel the feelings, and eventually I was discharged. From the asthma clinic, I cancelled my belief in gout attacks in my feet. Eventually, I was discharged from the rheumatology clinic. I cancelled my belief in um, kidney failure. I got a transplant. They gave me 13 medications, and I cancelled my belief in adverse effects from medications. And I went from 13 to one medication in about two years, with the doctor saying he doesn't know anyone taking less medicine as a transplant patient in the World Free Hospital. So. So there's no power in medicine. The power is in releasing your beliefs, and then the grace brings in the miraculous. And this is the last one. I really like this. You know, I, I, probably one of those ones that I could probably talk too much about this lesson. But anyway, uh, you really think you are alone unless another body is with you. Mm -hmm. That's a, that I think most people can get that. You know, so the, one of the biggest things on special relationships, and um, and actually that. Oh, I'm lonely, so I need another body with me, and that will cure my, my loneliness. Or, you know, I'm lonely, I need a partner, or I'm lonely, or whatever. And, you know, so it's putting on debt, because of course, that, that is like, a, that's a limiting idea, that the cure for loneliness is another body being around you. It'd be like, I'm feeling lonely, uh, so I need a donut, you see, and that will... But again, uh, anyway, I won't go into too much into addiction. If you really want a body to be the fix, when you get a body, you'll be happy for a short time. It will take the loneliness away, but it won't take it. 
the way for good. So number four, it is insanity that thinks these things. You call them laws and put them under different names in a long catalogue of rituals that have no use and serve no power. You think you must obey the laws of medicine, of economics and of health. Protect the body and you will be saved. These are not laws but madness. The body is endangered by the mind that hurts itself. The body suffers just in order that the mind will fail to see it is a victim of itself. The body's suffering is a mask that the mind holds up to hide what really suffers. It would not understand it is its own enemy, that it attacks itself and wants to die. It is from this your laws would save the body. It is for this that you think you are a body. There are no laws except the laws of God. This needs repeating over and over until you realise it applies to everything that you have made in opposition to God's will. Your magic has no meaning. What it is meant to save does not exist. Only what it is meant to hide will save you. I think this is probably alluding to the fact that a lot of people are obsessed about saving the body. And so when they're obsessed with the body, then they become very body identified and not re not capable of realizing the eternal. So, if the body become if the if the ego becomes too obsessed with saving the body and the body survival, then one becomes highly identified with the body, and that's like a that's like a red herring because if you let go of your obsession with the body and the world, then you realize the eternal or the nature the the eternal nature of God. So, paragraph 7, the laws of God can never be replaced. We will devote today to rejoicing that this is so. It is no longer a truth that we would hide. We realise instead it is a truth that keeps us free forever. Magic imprisons what the laws of God make free. The light has come because there are, are no laws but His. We will begin the longer practice periods today with a short review of the different kinds of laws we believe we must obey. These would include, for example, the laws of nutrition, of immunization, of medication, and of the body's protection in innumerable, innumerable ways. Think further, you believe in the laws of friendship, of good relationship and recipro reciprocity. Perhaps you even think that there are laws which set forth what is God's and what is yours. Many religions have been based on this. They would not say but damn in heaven's name. Yet there are, they are no more strange than the other laws you hold must be obeyed to make you safe. There are no laws but God's. Dismiss all foolish magical beliefs today and hold your mind in silent readiness to hear the voice that speaks the truth to you. You'll be listening to one who says there is no loss under the laws of God. Payment is neither given nor received. Exchange cannot be made. There are no substitutes. Nothing is replaced by something else. God's laws forever give and never take. So it's when the ego, when the ego is dead or deflated, that's when there's an abundance of, of love and synchronicity. What in the in when one's identified with the ego, then one is perceiving a world of separation and reciprocity and fear and money and relationships. So hear him who tells you this, and realize how foolish are the laws you thought upheld the world you thought you saw. Then listen further, he will tell you more about the love your father has for you, about the endless joy he offers you, about his yearning for his only son, created as his channel for creation, denied to him by his belief in hell. Let us today open God's channels to him and let his will extend through us to him. Thus is creation endlessly increased. His voice will speak to, to, of this to us, as well as of the joys of heaven, which his laws keep limitless forever. We will repeat today's idea until we have listened and understood there are no laws but God's. Then we will tell ourselves as a dedication with which the practice period concludes. I am under no laws but God's. We will repeat this dedication as often as possible today, at least four or five times an hour, as well as in response to
to any temptation to experience ourselves as subject to other laws throughout the day. It, has, it is our statement of freedom from all danger and all tyranny. It is our acknowledgement that God is our Father and that His Son is saved. <laughs>